Right, so without further ado, this is the inaugural lecture. Um, the inaugural by tradition is short, uh, so I've split it into two parts. In the first part of the lecture, I hope to share insights into three main strands of my research career over the past 20 plus years. First, um, we have school design um, and tropical modernism in Africa. Second, I'll have a short segue into digital tools for environmental design, which is a kind of tech bit of research I've been involved in recently. And finally, uh, really, social infrastructure, urban space and diaspora histories. In a way, they intertwine most of them, which I hope the lecture will, this short lecture will be able to get you to understand. The second part of the lecture um, is going to be my reflections uh, on what um, I think contemporary architectural research means in today's world. I suggest that the architectural research is innately multidisciplinary and attracts collaborations, and this has been central to the development of my research career. Finally, there's a call to all, especially to young researchers and those in architecture in particular, to pursue their ambitions with the knowledge that now, more than ever, there are few barriers to success. There may be challenges, but these can be overcome. And there's always support. One just has to determinedly seek it where it exists. Right, trigger warning here, although you've already got it in the background, there will be some music. Unfortunately, there'll be no time to dance. Although you're all invited to the next term's annual School of Architecture Disco or BASH, inquiries to the Manchester School of Architecture, Students Association, we have some very distinguished DJs. Hello, Tom. Right, so I'm starting the lecture talking about school design in, and uh, modernism and heritage in, in Africa. Earlier today, in connection with this lecture, a monograph on school design was launched at lunchtime. In a nutshell, what it did was to give um, a summary of my former postgraduate research journey, which began with an interest in um, schools and environmental design in Lagos. It was written as an MPhil thesis back in Cambridge. Um, more than two decades later, with a PhD and various funded research fellowships acquired, the Learning Spaces in Africa is a culmination of this research. It looked both back at the past of histories of schools in, in Africa and also it considers the issues related to contemporary challenges towards um, uh, providing education in the continent. Um, why schools? Well, arguably, after shelter and health, as the current United Nations Sustainable Development Goals suggest, education is a basic human right for all, which we are yet to achieve, uh, particularly in Africa. Africa's encounter with West, West African education is now more than 200 years old. However, um, my school research project has been able to document that in terms of its history from its, its early beginnings to today, and it talks about what it's like in the present. Um, the contemporary issues that affect um, school design to, in Africa um, are to do with the need, there's still a critical need, to achieve universal basic education for all of the world. This was projected to happen by 2020 with the initial Millennium Development Goals of the United Nations. Africa has yet to achieve this target. What is worse is that there's become an increasing divide between the rich and the poor. Um, essentially, with the, with the 1980s neoliberal consensus, uh, the economic policy for major educational investment has been reduced a lot in most, school, in most countries and also in donor um, countries as well. So there's been a re-emergence of a privately funded education system in various forms for the rich, whereas the global poor, many of whom are in Africa, in contrast, have less chances of accessing free education, despite, research, despite these research insights validated by, by my work. Um, schools are often the places where you can best deliver not just education, but other development interventions, such as school feeding programs, um, sanitation in some cases, and also um, their outreach um, locators um, for, for children who are displaced and in critical need. 
Future schools, as the Learning Spaces in Africa book posits, are likely to be very differently designed to take into account new educational needs and they may themselves become learning hubs for the future. Right. Some of these um, theories in terms of research into schools have, I've exercised in practical ways because I've worked with student teams um, I've worked with student teams and community groups to develop responses to school briefs and specs. Um, the top left-hand image shows uh, what was called the ICT Schools Project. Um, I had a call from an uh, internet entrepreneur who wanted to send computers to Af Af Africa but was interested in an architect who had designed or knew about school design in Africa. With the team, which was um, again a team from both Edinburgh and Glasgow schools of architecture, we designed a learning hub within a container which could act as a 24-hour learning facility for children and communities in rural areas and hard-to-reach communities. Um, this was with the knowledge that the shipping container, as a model, is the most ubiquitous object that can be hauled across the world. And with GPS, water collectors and solar collectors, this could become the sole development space or learning hub for these communities. Uh, the Preston School Project, to the right, um, uh, had the catchy acronym for the children, because it's primary school, PLOPS. Uh, and it was all to do with landscaping and producing um, a, play, a, play, a child friendly playground space. Um, in this case, the giraffe in the playground poster uh, was, was um, central to um, organising the community and the parents, particularly. And it um, started with this was a three year commitment to the primary school to work with um, students from Edinburgh University to help tidy, clear and design their playground. Uh, we never managed to get a real life giraffe over, but it was incredibly successful and indeed the image went viral for a while. Um, and what it meant was that parents' networks could in Edinburgh begin to start questioning what had become, I guess you'd call it the, the nanny state in terms of playgrounds not being places that children could really play in. So that was um, a, a, a score of success. Um, what I'm going to do now is to go on to my next um, theme, which is tropical modernism. And I think I can give you a bit of music here, hopefully. We'll see how we get on. So for those old enough in the audience, you'll hopefully appreciate the high life. Um, my research, I'll just turn it down a bit so you can hear me. Right. My research interest in West African schools, particularly those designed from the late 1950s to the early 70s, showed the clear principle of tropical design in their placement for cross-ventilation and ideal daylighting. This made the transition to studying the wider topic of tropical modernism easy. A discussion with Hannah LaRue, uh, who was from the Witz University of Witzvatersrand in Johannesburg about tropical schools, focused my, focused my research development uh, and the develop, and, um, acquisition of an RIBA research grant and British Academy research funding uh, to um, look into the influence of the Architectural Association Tropical School in developing a tropical architectural style in West Africa. Not coincidentally, there was archival evidence to show that KNUST, that's the Kumasi School of Architecture, the first in West Africa, was indeed the tropical laboratory for the Architectural Association in Africa. I'm going to turn this down a bit. Being able to delve firsthand into this heritage alerted me to two things. Firstly, that this history of which the AA was only the tip of the iceberg was much more um, pervasive. This is because the actors and players in shaping post-war architecture in Africa came from a range of global nationalities from both sides of the Iron Curtain and indeed from nations who technically had no diplomatic relations with much of Africa at the time. The archival records also cl clearly show that West Africa's first ind indigenous architects also played an active part in creating this heritage. Secondly, the, main, the, the then relative obscurity and difficulty of finding these records meant that it's, this history was unknown to many, particularly those of, for those to whom this architectural history is most focused on. 
that's Af African architectural historians and students. And just to show you some of these images, um, we have the um, famous engineering block uh, by Cubitt and Scott uh, at the KNUST uh, campus. And the original drawings, that's it um, about four years ago with uh, one of our research collaborators. No? And the famous Elder Dempster building, so those of you who know Lagos in the days, um, it used to be on the seafront, or on the shorefront in Lagos. It's now, well, in front of it now is the third mainland bridge. So, but it's a building in a bit of need at the moment, definitely. Um, so, I mean, part of what I was able to do um, in terms of developing this research, indeed, was helping to start to document these buildings. And also the AA in Africa exhibition was one of the first, it was back in 2003 in London at the Architectural Association. The, built, the photograph to the bottom left is Buckminster Fuller's visit to Kumasi in the 1960s. Um, and then just to highlight what I said, the three buildings here were designed by um, West African architects, Adedoku Adeyani, um, Olumide, Olumide Olumuiwa, and uh, John um, Owusu Ado, of which more later. They were, I have to say, mainly male architects, but they were certainly in practice at the same time of this renaissance in tropical architecture in its day. So, joining Dokomomo and Archi Africa was a way in which to ca help campaign for better education and knowledge about Africa's post war heritage in terms of architecture. I was pleased to be able to help set up the first West African Dokomomo chapter at KMUST with the help of Professor Glenn Dinning, who is another Edinburgh um, contingent, and importantly also working with architecture students from KMUST in Ghana. So indeed it was their heritage. The relationship with Archi Ar Ar Africa Ghana and its chair, Joe Addo, who will be getting a copy of this, is central to the Manx School of Architecture's creation of the international link with Ghana and will involve, we hope, the first team of MSA students working with Ghanaian students on a project to be launched at Archi Africa HQ in Accra next spring. And we hope that our head of school, Tom, will be leading the contingent. The Alan Von Richards archive project, which we looked at earlier, was a, similarly was a collaboration with the architect's daughter, Remy Von Richards, Hannah LaRue, Michael Collins, and two young postgraduate students, Katharina and Candice. It was also funded through a British Academy grants and university funds, and also the African Studies Association uh, grants as well. And it allowed us to digitize the drawings uh, of uh, Alan Vaughan Richards, who was the first British Nigerian architect. And it, we, it ended with a well-received exhibition, which you can see there. That's the exhibition in Edinburgh. Right, so we're now going to segue into digital tools for environmental design. Right, so um, a key tenet of good environmental design, as the, the research I've done into schools and the architecture of the tropics were able to demonstrate, was being able to design for thermal comfort. The idea was always that you could actually design without needing mechanical means um, of things like air conditioning and so on. Now, whilst there's been a current re-evaluation in academic circles about whether uh, some of the uh, so-called tropical design was techno-science, um, it's undeniably true that for our students today, they need to be able to design to respond to thermal comfort needs through responsible design. Today, with sustainability being a key factor in design education, buildings should be designed without the need for traditional air conditioning or central heating systems, uh, which are environmentally unsustainable. Uh, ideally, we should be looking at passive and therefore low energy systems, which the, the tropical modernists, modernists in their day uh, were all about. Thus, an understanding of the key principles of environmental design and measurement is important. Teaching environmental design to undergraduates made my colleague Gillian Tracy and I aware that we needed to get students to better understand the principles of building physics. So with um, RKE funds, an HEA grant and further university hub funding, we were able to work to develop um, um, an app, which I'll talk about now. Um, our idea was to get them to understand how to measure things like daylighting, 
uh, there's a factor called the daylight factor. Not to go into too much techno science, basically you need about 2% of daylight factor in terms of contrast to be able to write in a normal school in the tropics particularly without needing lighting, which should be standard in, in de design. What we found out was that because the principles were very, I guess, mathematically oriented, what we were trying to do was to look at a form of model uh, that we could strip down because uh, there had been architectural models over time. This is the LT model from Cambridge, which I had looked at. Uh, there is the IES model, which is from Glasgow. And we then thought, well, we're going to look at something that students could work on themselves. And most students I know, including my daughter, have a smartphone in their pocket. So the idea was to develop an app for um, measuring um, lighting and so on. So what we did do was exactly that. Um, so, what we did was to um, develop, first of all, an app that allowed students to calculate the daylight factor and amount of brightness. And this enabled students to connect the, with the art of measuring using their mobile phones as one would with a traditional thermometer. So the idea was they could see the numbers changing. So if you move your mobile phone to a dark area, it get, the numbers are lower, uh, brighter area it becomes brighter. So that was what we first did. Then we went to work, on, work, work with a Chinese student, a talented Chinese student, PhD, uh, who was interested in thermal comfort. So we now have a suite of apps called the, um, Eden App Lighting and Eden App um, Comfort. And what's happened now is that Eden Apps has moved to Manmet, and it's called Eden App Labs. And we're hoping to develop an acoustic measurement app to complete the suite of tools for learning. So you might say, well, what are the applications? Well, imagine this, you walk into a hotel room and you're, you, you're able to speak at, to the receptionist and say, I know exactly what temperature I want, what humidity and what comfort. The idea about the app is that you can personalize your idea about what your comfort is. So it does potentially have a commercial, um, um, fut a commercial future. Any developers come and see me after the lecture, please. Right. The formation of Eden App Labs has been a great example of collaboration as it's allowed us to work with parts of the then university in our daily lives that we would, as architecture lecturers, never have had to go to. So, for example, as I said, we teamed up with the coder who did a lot of the coding and was able to do um, both an app for the Android and the Apple system. It was from Romania. Um, the students were from um, Nigeria and um, China and we as lecturers were from the United Kingdom and Scotland. So, I mean, all told, it was a multidisciplinary team, both in terms of what we brought to the project and where we were from. Um, unfortunately, the lure of Silicon Valley meant that our app guy soon left the United Kingdom for the USA. So thank you, Cosman, wherever you are. Um, so, we'll go straight on to the next, because I know time is going by, and that's going to be social infrastructure and urban space, uh, and indeed, diaspora, histories. So this section, which is the final part of this, um, amplifies the importance of multinational networks and livelihoods in today's world, in the UK in particular. My interest in architectural research has always focused on the social and the effects of architecture, the built environment and urban space on communities. At my first full-time lectureship at Liverpool University, it allowed me to pursue this interest in, in proper. So as a young researcher, I worked with Councillor Gideon ben Tobin on re researching into the black community in Liverpool, which had a strong West African component to it and its relationship to the then very um, derelict Granby Toxeth, a decade after the riots, was of interest. This opened up a sociological world which went much farther than the black community. Princess Street Synagogue, for example, opened my research to the Jewish community in Liverpool and the spatial adjacency of Liverpool's Chinatown to the, the Toxeth L8 area before the construction of the now famous Chinese Arch enabled me to find out much more about one of Europe's oldest Chinese communities. Importantly for this lecture also, it enabled me to encounter other academics, including Professor Tunde Zach Williams. Tunde, two colleagues and I would go on to plan and run the Africa 2000 conference in Liverpool with our guest of honour being the late Ali Mazui. 
and it led to, um, I guess, my first joint publication of the edited volume, Africa Beyond the Postcolonial. My work in this area went on to explore the similarities and differences of contested spaces and the challenges of social infrastructure provision in places like this. Um, and uh, a, a really interesting paper that was well received was the comparison between Cape Town's District 6 community and indeed Granby Toxton. Um, a further collaboration with Samir Beguin, um, which I'll go back to, um, involved the production of two edited volumes on gated communities. The theory here was that gated communities in a lot of the emerging world are very different from the idea that we have of gated communities in the West. Uh, there are historical, spatial and other reasons why a gated community would have a different impact on the way in which people live. In areas where social infrastructure is not uh, standard, oftentimes a community is grouped together to make sure they're able to get the security um, and social infrastructure such as indeed uh, water through boreholes and so on and sometimes actually um, lighting systems uh, more recently in term with um, solar collectors and so on. Um, I think again just to do a segue, I mean part of what this helped me to do in terms of my research in Liverpool was indeed as you can see the Liverpool Arch and so on. And the point I'm making here is actually cultural as well. Um, architecture very much in, inhabits a cultural space. And I would say, particularly with uh, migrant communities, how they actually associate has a lot to do with the culture they bring to the space. And that is both music, uh, textiles, and other things. And again, Manchester is a prime example of a space like this. So here I'd like to reflect on what contemporary architectural research means in today's world. I suggest that Architectural research is innately multidisciplinary and, att and attracts collaborations. And as I said, this has been central to my research. With the benefit of a productive quarter century of architectural research, this lecture gives me an opportunity to question what I can make of this journey. I thought a few headings might be a good way to do this. First of all, I would say architecture is interdisciplinary and also international. As an architectural practice, which I left rather fast, the architectural, architectural research for most involves more than one single discipline. The richness of architecture, as with medicine and other professions, is that it has a wide disciplinary coverage, with many subjects contributing to this. This is a strength of the top architecture schools, of which we have to include Manchester School of Architecture. And we are establishing ourselves very much in this place in the top tier of both architectural teaching and research. Secondly, architectural research is collaborative. Whilst I have worked as an individual researcher quite successfully, arguably my most enjoyable work has been as part of a wider team. I owe much to the depth and involvement of my work to collaborators, including here Tunde, Ian, uh, Lukash and others who are not here at the moment. Um, I would also want to mention here the West African Rapid Urbanisation and Heritage Network, uh, WARU, those are my colleagues in Ghana and Nigeria particularly, who are my recent collaborators and, and research team. Indeed, some of the team members, and this is where Kukua and Victoria are part of, uh, and indeed Frimpong and also um, Dr Irene Apianing are part of. We've already run a successful architecture writing workshop in Accra, Ghana, last July, with students from Ghana and abroad. So thank you again, Kukua and um, Victoria, for being here. And then I would say, finally, architecture is clearly social. Um, for, many architect for many, architecture remains embodied in the architecture of the star architect. But I would hazard a guess that for most architects, it's not the famous architect who's designing wonderful buildings that are, whatever, skyscrapers, maybe, all over the world. Uh, the social is as important, if not more so, than the object or the statement building. The world needs good architecture and a better understanding of how the, the provision of well-designed social infrastructure can make a difference to people. And finally, I would say that architecture is indeed special. Firstly, as with engineering this time, you need to spend at least a significant part of a decade to become an architect, or, fully, or at least fully qualified to practice. 
Secondly, because as said at the beginning of this talk, shelter is a basic human right for which I would argue the architect takes a strong responsibility in delivering, as with other forms of social infrastructure like schools and so on. And these are the means by which we make life livable. I feel honoured and take seriously my role as research professor at the, uh, of architecture at Manchester School of Architecture at Manmet. Manchester in particular is a city to which I feel proud to be associated. I am rapidly learning about the 5th Pan-African Congress meeting which took place in this city and I believe the plaque commemorating this event is only a stone throw away from this lecture theatre. This involves African greats like Kwame Nkrumah, Aja Wachuku, Julius Nyerere and Hastings Banda to name just a few of the political greats who, who grace the city. Whilst it's been said that the Manchester's press of the day might, not, might have had a lukewarm reception in having this reported, ordinary Mancunians and Manchester as a city welcomed the Pan-African Congress delegates to their already established African community. Manchester then and still remains a city renowned for its promotion of democracy and access to all as its founding fathers, and they were fathers, had decreed. In the light of this course, therefore, we should not also um, forget this is also the city of Emmeline Pankhurst and the suffragette. So, from these observations, how can we promote architectural research today? Well, for architectural research, edu uh, educational research, therefore, we need a wider and more diverse team of architects and researchers um, tackling these problems. That's of pro providing an architecture for everybody. Today's architecture schools generally have reached a near 50-50 gender enrolment parity, particularly at undergraduate level, and that's a very good start. However, figures for ethnic, socio-economic diversity, and indeed um, racial diversity have a long way to go, and this is something we need to work on. Unsurprisingly, also, to use the African parlance, at the top of the palm tree, diversity particularly remains a challenge. Manchester School of Architecture is in the right place and it's at the right time to, um, in its evolution to rise up to this challenge. I wish therefore to end this lecture by acknowledging those whose encouragement has helped inspire me to get to where I am today or get to where I've become, many of whom are with me today. Significant though amongst those who were unable to be here are Professor John Owusu-Addo, we saw his building. He was the former head and first African head of the architecture school at the University of Nigeria uh, in Sukkha, and he's 90, like my mother. Uh, and also, surely today, he's one of Ghana's oldest pioneer architects. I would also like to thank my PhD supervisor, Professor Robin Spence in Cambridge, who encouraged me to keep applying, which I did, and I finally got the scholarship. Um, so they were very, very instrumental in uh, my actually going on to be an architect and a researcher. I'd like to end this lecture, because I can, with a dedication to my architectural heroes, all of whom are women, and they are of different shapes and hues. Some of them have passed on to the other world, but many of whom I was able to have the pleasure to meet. So these women have, or had all in their lives, demonstrated that barriers such as gender, race and class, to name but a few, were challenges they were able to overcome in their pursuit of brilliance in their careers. Finally, to the next generation of researchers of all disciplines, but obviously especially to my discipline, architecture, yours is the future. You only need to keep your eyes on the prize. Thank you. Open the wind. Open the window. Open the window. Open the window.